Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jay Singh, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA Ames Environmental Technologies. Our presenter today is Michael Flynn, and he will be talking about three different technologies, contaminated water treatment, habitat water wall for water, solids, and atmosphere recycle and reuse, as well as algae photobioreactor using floating enclosures with semi-permeable membranes. Mr. Flynn is Principal Investigator in Water Recycling Technology Development at NASA Ames Research Center. He has over 32 years of experience in the development of advanced life support systems and is a lead for the development of spacecraft water recycling systems. He has over 120 peer-reviewed publications in the field. He has, reviewed, he has received an AIAA Best Space Architecture Paper Award Four of his papers have been selected for republication in the SAE International's Transactions Journal. He has received two R&D 100 awards, a Wright Brothers Medal and an Arc T Caldwell Merit Award. He has received six NASA Spotlight Awards and has developed five NASA patents. He has developed water recycling systems for NASA, the Army, commercial space, and terrestrial green building applications. Mr. Flynn has a BS in mechanical engineering from San Francisco State University. Following Michael's presentations on the technologies, I will be giving a short presentation on how NASA licenses uh, license technologies to outside organizations. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. We'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end. So at this point, I'm gonna go turn it over to you, Michael. Uh, what I'd like to do first is take a step back and provide you a little bit of the context uh, with it, with, within which the, these technologies were developed. Uh, all of these patents and technologies came out of the NASA Advanced Life Support Program. The Advanced Life Support Program is focused on basically primarily keeping astronauts alive. So it includes everything from water recycling, air recycling, thermal control, food production, uh, 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 some elements of spacesuit uh, 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 operation as, as far as they um, impact human life. And the real primary objective is to reduce costs. Uh, you know, we can keep astronauts alive in space by launching water and launching tanks of air at a very high uh, cost. Uh, but if we're able to recycle water, recycle air, recycle the uh, thermal environment in space, there's a significant reduction in mass and therefore a significant reduction in costs. Uh, so the objective of life support is to take the outputs, which are wastewater, volatile, organic, solid waste, and, uh, and then transfer them back and use them as the inputs. So use wastewater as a source of drinking water, use the uh, 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 carbon dioxide, break it apart, use it as a source of oxygen, use a, a waste as nutrients for food and temperature control. Uh, the, the primary test bed that we utilize for these systems is the International Space Station. Uh, the International Space Station has a complete uh, life support system on it. It recycles all the water, recycles all the urine, uh, crew urine and humidity condensate and uses it uh, to produce drinking water for the crew, so a true toilet uh, tap system. Uh, there are no other sources of water on ISS other than recycled water. Uh, we also recycle the atmosphere. We do complete carbon sequestration on ISS and control CO2 level and turn carbon uh, carbon dioxide into uh, uh, methane, or we have the ability to do graphitic carbon, and uh, we're even doing research on developing sort of bioplastics out of these uh, carbon sources. Uh, so the ISS is, is probably the closest to a completely sustainable uh, life support system uh, that, that has been developed to this point. Uh, so just talk a little bit about the uh, water system on ISS. This is a picture of the water system here, the top right-hand corner. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a mechanical device. It's basically a machine, a physical chemical water purification system. It uses distillation, absorption, and oxidation. Those are all non-biological technologies. Uh, you can see down the bottom picture, that's a picture of the astronauts on the first day they were allowed to uh, drink their own urine. Uh, they look pretty happy there. Actually, that picture is not correct because this is microgravity, so their, you know, their orientation is, is, is whatever it needs to be. And uh, that's a key point of this life support system, the water systems and everything on ISS, which is that they're designed for zero gravity operation, which makes a 
increasingly complex requirements for these mechanical devices. For instance, pumps don't work in microgravity, so you have to have all custom developed systems. And that really leads to one of what we call one of the biggest problems of the International Space Station and the concepts that went behind the International Space Station is that is that they're, they're large machines basically, and the astronauts live inside of this uh, complex machine and maintenance becomes a problematic issue. So uh, it, you, you can imagine looking at the complexity, I think this is a laboratory mod module that we're looking at here. Uh, you can imagine what the maintenance requirements are for this type of a system. And we can very quickly come to a situation where maintenance becomes our primary operations in space. So NASA is interested in looking at alternative approaches, sort of radical deviations from this, what we call the romance of the machine. Uh, you guys are all familiar with that. You probably all own cars. You know that car can break down. Um, it's likely that it will break down at some point in its life. And you can call the AAA to come pick you up or stay at a hotel if you get broken down. But you know, if you're traveling to Mars, that's not really an option. On a trip to Mars, reliability is key. If the life support system fails, the mission will fail and the crew potentially could die as well. So we're interested in looking at you know, radically different approaches that provide uh, an increased level of reliability and reduce the mass required for the missions. Currently for mechanical systems like we have on the International Space Station, the approach used is triple redundancy. And that means that any mechanical system that has a potential failure that's critical to the mission, would, we would have to bring three versions of them or three sets of spare parts. And this has an impact to the mission that it increases the cost of the mission by close to three as well, because most of our costs are launch costs, kilograms on the, on the payload application. So in the water walls project, what we're doing is looking for a dramatically different approach to providing life support systems. And uh, we're doing it using a technique called biomimicry, which is to look at biological systems and how they function and what makes them very reliable and then mimic that level of reliability. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we move down. But first, let's talk a little bit about what it takes to go to Mars, what it takes to uh, conduct a Mars mission. So this is an orbital geometry diagram. And you can see here uh, is Earth, here's where we are. And at some point, Mars is, uh, is in, in an orbital relationship to Earth. And the, the key is to launch a spacecraft and have it arrive at Mars as Mars moves through its orbital geometry at, at, a, at the at correct point when the spacecraft and Mars are at the same spot. Um, and then the crew would, would take a descent vehicle down to Mars and the vehicle, the transit vehicle would then uh, return back to Earth. And the idea is that the transit vehicle will be constantly in orbit between Earth and Mars uh, and the uh, and then vehicles will be used to to lift off of the Earth and go to that transit vehicle, and then on Mars to come from the transit vehicle and and descend down to the surface of Mars and uh, vice versa. So the water walls concept really focused on this vehicle, this transit vehicle that is in orbit between Earth and Mars, and uh, theoretically would continue that orbit. And if you had two of these vehicles, then you could every year provide the ability to go to Mars and the ability to come back from Mars. So the, it's the development of this infrastructure that's the key. And NASA has done a lot of work in this area. This is an example, artist rendition of one of these transit vehicles. And you can see that the visiting spacecraft, the Earth spacecraft is attached to the left and the Mars ascent vehicle and ascent vehicles attached to the right. And uh, so in a transit mode, uh, all these uh, uh, elements are put together. But then when you arrive either at Mars or Earth, the crew would descend uh, using the descent and ascent vehicles. Um, now, NASA has done some testing of these systems. And this is a picture on the bottom of the International Space Station with the Bigelow inflatable space habitat attached to it. And one of the key questions associated with a transit vehicle has to do with radiation protection. Uh, you're going to be in deep space for long periods of time and exposed to both solar and galactic radiation and developing radiation protection techniques is critical. And that's one of the objectives of the Bigelow module on the International Space Station. So the water walls concept kind of takes us to the next level. It, it utilizes the sort of the Bigelow inflatable spacecraft structure as a baseline, but it could be adapted to any kind of transit vehicle. And what it does is it tries to impart 
a, a higher level of reliability for the life support system by having a massively parallel uh, uh, co construct. And that's kind of how your body works. If you think about it, your body is composed of uh, millions and millions of cells, individual cells that perform individual functions. And it really doesn't matter if one of these cells is damaged or broken. It doesn't matter if hundreds of them are broken or even thousands of them are broken because there are so many of them that there's a massively redundant uh, capability included in that. So when we take this concept and apply it to a uh, water walls concept and inflatable structure, what we do is we take the life support system and we break it into small discrete elements and then it's placed around the outside surface of the inflatable structure. So what you see here is a cross-section inflatable structure and the uh, sort of greenish looking bags that are placed around the outer surface of the habitat are the water walls elements. Now I have a, a blow up of that, another, another cross section through the center axis of the spacecraft and over in the picture to the right, what you can see is a sort of a wire mesh that just protects these uh, life support bags. And then there's a series of green bags there that perform the life support function. And then of course the membrane that provides, uh, uh, makes it airtight and the outer fabric structure of uh, the water walls. So we're going to talk a little bit more about these bags and how they work. Uh, this is a, a artist rendition of how these bags would be installed. So these are individual small little bags. They're about 25 centimeters wide, about 50 centimeters long. And they're configured in a variety of different functions to perform, for instance, CO2 sequestration, uh, removing humidity condensate out of the atmosphere, water purification, solid waste treatment, uh, and thermal control. Each one of these bags are, is placed in the outer wall of the spacecraft in order to provide radiation protection. One of the biggest, um, uh, one of the best ways to protect uh, a spacecraft from uh, radiation is using water. Water absorbs radiation very well and produces hydrogen as a byproduct, which is not a particularly dangerous ion in a spacecraft uh, environment. So I'm gonna move uh, now to talk about sort of the top level concept. So we have these bags that are placed inside the spacecraft and uh, each one of them or each set of them produces different functions. For instance, block one, which is climate control, which is primarily humidity control and thermal control is provided by these bags. Uh, block, uh, block two, which is contaminant control, deals with volatile organics that may be in the atmosphere of the spacecraft. And we provide a method for reducing both the volatile and the semi-volatile organics. Uh, block three is air revitalization. revitalization. This is converting carbon dioxide that's produced by the crew into O2 and also a byproduct producing nutrients that can be used uh, for a variety of other applications. And then the fourth block, which is the power and wastewater block. In this one, we have gray water and urine processing. We also have black water, which is feces and, and other types of solid waste uh, 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 processing. And then we also uh, take some of those byproducts and use them in organic fuel cells to produce electricity to supplement the uh, requirements of the habitat. So this all looks pretty complicated, but I'm gonna go and talk a little bit about each one and show you how these function. So this would be the humidity control cycle. So in, the, in this scenario, uh, these bags, are actually filled with salt water. And for any of those of you who live in humid environments, you're all very familiar with the fact that the salt shaker doesn't work. Uh, water condenses inside the salt shaker and causes it all to clump together. That's called an osmotic force. And we're basically just using that same principle in this scenario where we have a bag that allows gases to pass through it. And inside the bag, we have a salt water solution and uh, the saltwater solution absorbs the water out of the atmosphere, there, dehumid thereby dehumidifying the water. When that happens, it gives off heat. When the water condenses in the saltwater solution, it gives off heat. So we have to have some cooling capability, and that's what the uh, two tubes are. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how this works, because I know it's kind of a complicated concept, and I'll try to simplify it down here for you. Let's just take a very simple example, and it kind of explains what osmotic forces are, why that that salt shaker doesn't work on a humid day. If I take a, a beaker and glue a membrane in, in, inside of it, separating the beaker into two halves, and on one side I put tap water and on the other side I put salt water, and then I just leave it in that situation for several hours and come back later, what, what I'll find is that the tap water side has dropped 
and the saltwater side, the diluted saltwater side, has increased. And this occurs because the membrane will not allow salts to pass through it, but will allow water to pass through it. When I, when I started off, uh, step one, I had a very ordered system with tap water and salt water equal concentrations on both sides of the membrane. There's a principle called entropy, and entropy states that ordered systems move to disorder, and when they do that, they give off energy. And if you want to go in the opposite direction, you have to put energy into it. So this concept of entropy is what is driving the water across the membrane. It's removing the water from the tap side and moving it all over to the diluted uh, side because that side has a lower potential energy associated with it. So we can use this in our bags if the bag has salt water inside of it. And then instead of tap water, we just have humid air on the outside of the bag. The water in the humid air will pass through the membrane and dilute down the salt water. Now we use a special type of membrane in these bags. They're called pervaporation membranes. And these are membranes that have um, pores in them of a, of a very uniform and select size. And these pores fill with water and a small meniscus forms inside the pore. And that allows the, the water to stay inside the, uh, the membrane and have gas or humid air on the outside of it. And it allows a surface for transfer of water from the air into the what we call the draw solution or the salt water solution. So that's that's you know getting into the details of how these per, per, per evaporation membrane bags work. We also use a similar approach for dealing with carbon dioxide in the crew atmosphere. In this case, the bags are filled with algae. The algae grows and uh, uses the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Again, it's a per evaporation membrane to these bags. And so the CO2 can dissolve into the solution and uh, come, come into equilibrium in the solution, and then the algae will uh, absorb the carbon dioxide and split water and produce oxygen. The oxygen, again, is diffused outside of the, outside of the bag. Eventually, the algae becomes too concentrated and becomes basically a solid, and then we have to split the bags up, remove some of the algae, reseed new bags, and then those uh, remaining algae bags go into the solid waste processing uh, scenario. Uh, wastewater, we use a, a slightly different type of a bag. In this situation, it has a, um, it is not a, a gas permeable bag. The outside of the membrane will, does not allow gases to pass through it, but internal inside the bag, and you can see it so, sort of in the center images here, there's a membrane placed internally inside the bag. And on one side of the membrane, it's just like the, the beaker cup example, we put urine and other wastewater sources, hygiene water, things like that. And then on the other side, we put a salt water solution. The water transfers across the membrane, diluting out the salt water, concentrating up the contaminants in the feed. And then the water is regenerated by putting it through a desalination system, such as a reverse osmosis system that allows us to do that. The solids then that get concentrated on the feed side of the bag are concentrated up and then mixed with feces and other solid waste and then they're dried to a level at which bacteria and funguses can no longer grow in them. And then they are placed around the outer edge for, uh, for recycle purposes. And I know you guys all wanna see that uh, fecal simulant. That's what everybody's always interested in. So here are some pictures, example, using a fecal simulant, not actual feces. Uh, we fill the bag up with fecal simulant, add salt water to the back side of it, leave it there for you know, several days, and then we, what we've done here is cut open the bag so that you can see internally that the formerly liquid wastes are now basically a tar-like substance, a very, very uh, uh, dense tar-like substance. And then, so normally the bags aren't cut open, they remain sealed at all times, but then the bags, if you look at the picture on the bottom, the bags are placed around the outer surface of the inflatable structure, and over time convert it into a solid structure that has a high potential for radiation prote pro protection. To provide enough radiation protection for galactic-based radiation takes meters thick of material. And the possibility of launching that from Earth is, is very limited due to the cost to, to launch that amount of material. So the idea of the water walls concept is that we use the byproducts of the life support system to build up that protective radiation layer uh, as a function of time. That's kind of one of the critical aspects of the water wall. So the idea is that there is no waste in this kind of a system. There is no byproduct, no, no, no garbage, no, nothing is returned back to Earth eventually. It all just builds up on the spacecraft 
providing more and more radiation protection as a function of time. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tr technology transfer activities that came out of this active uh, out of the water wells project. You know, the water wells project really doesn't have a lot of technology transfer in its own formation. It's really highly specialized to uh, transit vehicle application. But there is a lot of technologies that came out of developing that that do have a, a commercial potential. Uh, the first one is the uh, CO2 sequestration, the algae bags, uh, and that has been patented uh, by itself for terrestrial applications. And the second one deals primarily with the water treatment aspects of it, the use of the uh, forward osmosis membrane uh, for urine purification. That also is a, a separate pack, uh, a patent that uh, these are both uh, NASA patents. So I'm going to start talking about the algae one first. So one of the concepts that came up uh, uh, early on in developing this technology uh, deals with dead zones on the Earth. So dead zones are, are zones associated primarily with river deltas or or human habitation, where nitrogen that's in waste in sewage, you know, it comes out of your urine and it comes from uh, fertilizers that are applied to agriculture and also from livestock, from the waste of livestock. Uh, these uh, uh, are usually treated, but usually not to remove nitrogen. And so the nitrogen ends up in the water column, it gets out into the delta, into the oceans, and you get an area where you get an algae bloom because of all the nitrogen. And then the algae eventually die, and when they die, they float to the bottom, and bacteria consume the algae, and the bacteria consume all of the oxygen out of the uh, water column, and you get these dead zones that are associated with uh, human habitation. And they're all over the world. Uh, everywhere you have large human populations, uh, you see these dead zones being developed. There, there are uh, activities going on to start to try to deal with nitrogen, uh, discharges, but uh, you know they're way off in the future and, and very controversial. So the idea was to take the bags that we had developed for uh, the water walls concept and actually place them in the water in these dead zones in these areas with, that have high nitrogen concentrations. And the bags are, are have two sides to them. One side is exposed is transparent and is exposed to the sunlight and the atmosphere. And the other side is underwater. The side that's underwater, we use a membrane that allows nitrogen to easily flow through the membrane. And then once it gets inside the membrane, the algae that is growing inside the membrane uh, 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 sequesters the nitrogen and produces a variety of useful products. Primarily the one that originally was being looked at at, uh, at algae omega was fuels, biofuels, uh, lipids and things that can be extracted out of the algae. As time went on, it became clear that that market was not a really a viable market. So then we looked at other options, for instance, providing food supplements for animals, food supplements for aquaculture, or the production of fine chemicals uh, out of genetically modified uh, algae. Um, this technique was actually demonstrated in a pilot demonstration plant at the San Francisco Public Utilities. So this is a picture of these, they're not bags anymore, they're more tubes and they're placed in a primary clarifying tank. Um, and these uh, did demonstrate effective removal of nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Uh, well, we determined that the limiting factor was actually carbon dioxide absorption out of the atmosphere in the bags. As you can see in this picture, the surface area of the bag that's actually to the atmosphere is, is relatively small. And uh, so we were, we were limited by our carbon uh, uptake from uh, carbon dioxide. And that led to a modification of the, of the basic concept, um, which was to actually fill the bags with sewage. So to take sewage from say, a feedlot or sewage from a, a sewage treatment facility and fill the bags with sewage, and then the bacteria in the bags will, in the sewage, will decompose the sewage, produce carbon dioxide, and then the carbon dioxide would supplement the amount of carbon dioxide that we could absorb out of the atmosphere. Um, and would also, in effect, treat the sewage. And if it's done in a saltwater environment, that using a forward osmosis membrane on the bottom of the bag, we could actually have the water uh, into the water column, purified water, transporting the col water column. So this provided a, a variety of different benefits. Number one, it provided a method to treat the wastewater that had high nitrogen in it. Um, and it also reduced pollution discharges, as well as producing the algae that we were uh, targeting uh, developing. 
So that led to a, a variety of different configurations. One of them that was integrated with aquaculture where the sewage actually came from the aquaculture and then the algae was used as feed for the aquaculture. So the fish were truly eating their own waste. Um, and a version that uh, was land-based uh, that was designed to deal with uh, farmers, uh, pig lots and dairies that produce an awful lot of manure and typically they're putting them into a pond and letting it uh, a bio treat inside the pond. And so the idea was to take that pond and modify it uh, to use the uh, omega a bag concept on the surface of it and, and potentially also have an integrated aquaculture system uh, in the pond. And this has turned out to be the most viable of all the configurations because there's a, a great demand for solutions in this uh, market sector. And um, and so we, I think most of the projects that went the farthest are, 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 are of this type. Um, this Algae Omega uh, system actually was eventually turned into a nonprofit called the Omega Global Initiative, and it's run by some, a person by the name of Dr. Jonathan Trent. And if you want to learn more about it, you should look. There's a, just type his name in uh, to bring up an awful lot with, uh, with Algae Omega. And he's given a couple of TED Talks, too, that I think are very instructive as to how to utilize this technology in a terrestrial application. Um, but to make a long story short, uh, this project actually became relatively big. There were there were uh, you know five different groups in countries all over the world that were interested in applying this technology. Uh, those are still going on, of course, with COVID. Everything's kind of on the back burner right now. Um, there was also a version of uh, Algae Omega that was a for-profit. Uh, oftentimes, farmers don't have a hard time dealing with nonprofits, and so there was an organization that was set up uh, for for those applications as well. That concludes the omega portion of it. Now I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about the contaminated wastewater treatment patent. Um, and this again uses forward osmosis. And you know, forward osmosis may sound kind of like an odd technology and something you've never heard of before, but you, you're actually very familiar with it. You're actually an expert in forward osmosis because that's how your body works. That's how your small intestine works when you drink water. Tra tra travels through your stomach and your goes into your small intestine, and then it's absorbed in your small intestine. Uh, into your blood. That's also the way plant root zones work. Uh, and, you know, some plants, some trees, sequoia trees are, you know, thousands of years old and they have membranes that are embedded into soil and extract water out of soil. So, you know, it's a very reliable technique for water purification. It's, it's a technique that nature has been using for many, many, many eons and virtually all uh, biological water purification uses some form of it. Um, just going back to your uh, uh, that uh, cup example where we had a, a cup or beaker that had a membrane glued into it. We put tap water on one side, and previously we put salt water on one side of it. But as you remember, I didn't talk about chemistry when I was describing that technology because chemistry really doesn't matter. This is this is entropy. It's physics, and so it does, we don't have to use salt water. We can actually use anything. We can we can take. Uh, you know, powdered country time lemonade and put it on one side of this membrane and the same process will work. The, 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 powder, the country time lemonade will exert an osmotic force that will cause water to go across the membrane and then it will get diluted out until you have a diluted concentrate that is the right concentration to just drink it directly. So it provides you with a way of producing an engineered drink out of contaminated wastewater. So the way we do these is like uh, like for the water walls concept is through uh, uh, manufacturing these bags and these bags are uh, are filled with water. So the, the version on the left hand side is where you put the contaminated wastewater and then the version on the right hand side, you can see the powdered. I think that's actually Gatorade in there. It's powdered Gatorade and uh, you just put the powder on it. So it has a long shelf life. You fill the uh, feed side up with water. Let it sit for a few hours. Water will transport across the membrane and dilute out the country time lemonade and produce a drink that you can drink directly. Uh, th this technology was originally developed by a company called Osmotech, and they uh, actually had quite a bit of success selling these as uh, commercial products for, for uh, U.S. soldiers uh, that were out in the field. They could take contaminated water from river water or wherever it was and produce an engineered drink on one side. Uh, and that drink can not only just have country time lemonade, it can be fortified with, uh, you know, antibiotics or nutrients or electrolytes, whatever, however you want to uh, develop it. Uh, this is a cutaway that shows what that bag looks like. There's 
There's two plastic flexible enclosures that are uh, heat sealed with a membrane that separates them into two halves of one side, and then some ports that are attached so that you can add contaminated water and actually remove the drink out of the uh, other side of it. Um, this is just some example of, the, of, uh, of treating with urine. Of course, for NASA applications, NASA is also interested in these bags. What we're primarily interested in them for is uh, EVA activities. So the idea is to integrate them in with the pantsuit. So if you have like an emergency situation where uh, the astronaut is on an EVA or an emergency return to Earth wearing a pressure suit um, and they have to urinate, they have uh, some place to urinate into, they urinate directly into the bag and then the bag will produce a drink. So if they're for a long enough period of time on this uh, mission or emergency situation, they'll actually have a drink that they can drink that, that is recycled from their urine. And that application, the drink actually provides all the calories that they need as well as all the electrolytes and all the water. So it's basically a kind of stay alive for a few days uh, kind of concept. Um, as you can see, the flux rate across these membranes is relatively low, about 145 milliliters per meter hour. So that means to, in order for this product to work, you need lots of hours. You need to have a you know six hours, eight hour period of time for the bag to fully transport all the water across it. Uh, the key to this uh, bag, though, is the pervaporation membrane we're using internally into it that provides really high level of organic rejection. So yeah, we did some tests with urine. The average total organic content of the urine was around 5,500 uh, parts per million milligrams per liter. And we were able to reduce that down to about 21. So that's about a 99.6 rejection percent rejection of the uh, content of the urine. And the inorganic content is almost completely rejected in this particular application. They, they really, or inorganics can't, can't get across the membrane at all. We've uh, analyzed what is this product, TOC, and it's primarily uh, methanol and ethanol. If you let the feed sit around for a while, it starts decomposing, producing uh, primarily organics like methanol and ethanol. And those are both allowable. Again, we're producing a sort of a food product here, not, not a drinking water product. We're, you know, we're starting off with powdered country time lemonade, so there's already a lot of organic content in it, a lot of sugars and things like that. Um, this picture shows you how the bag works. Remember I talked about that it takes time for the bag to function. So this plot shows the amount of water that's produced versus the time in hours. And if you just let this bag go to equilibrium, it can take a very long time for the flux of water to stop going across it. However, we typically aren't interested in those really long, far out there data times. We primarily focus on a, a, a normal operating range that ranges between say six and 12 to 13 hours. That's a typical run for the bag. So it does require some planning to use this bag. Um, also, the bag doesn't recycle all the water, it recycles a portion of the water. If the feed's pure water and there's no contaminants in it, of course, it can get 100% water recovery rate. But for instance, urine has a lot of byproducts in it, it has a lot of organics and a lot of inorganics. And as we showed previously, they do not pass through the membrane, so they become concentrated in the feed and produce this concentrated byproduct. And that reduces the water recovery rate that you can achieve. So depending on how contaminated your feed is, it's going to impact how much water you can actually produce using the bag. Uh, one of the more recent projects we've been working on with this bag deals with infant formula. Um, I get a lot of uh, interns that come from different parts of the world, developing parts of the world, and come spend summers doing internships here. And, and they expressed that they thought that the best application for the bag was actually for infant formula. So in a lot of places in the developing world, if you're not able to breastfeed a child, you're gonna use powdered infant formula. And if you make that powdered infant formula out of water that is questionable, can be contaminated, uh, the child can get diarrhea and then become dehydrated. And it's one of the main causes of death, particularly in the developing world, is this dehydration because as the child becomes more dehydrated, you give them more water, and that has more contaminants, bi biological contaminants primarily, that, that extend the dehydration, and then the, the child dies of dehydration. So the idea was to develop an infant formula bag, and we start off with a powdered infant formula, so it has a very long shelf life. And you add, in this case, tap water, the best quality water that you have to the bag, and uh, it ensures that no bacteria or, or viruses can transfer from the feed water into the infant formula. Uh, on the uh, back side of the bag. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work with local universities analyzing, you know, how to make these kinds of bags. What would be the costs for distribution, like for disaster relief application? And uh, in general, it seems that it, with a large enough run that you could produce these bags from about a dollar a bag to a, a maximum of five dollars a bag. Uh, we've also gone beyond the bag concept. We've sort of broken apart the bag and turned it into sort of a more of an industrial kind of a process. This is a forward osmosis water recycling system that's located at uh, NASA's Ames Research Center. It's the uh, lar lo longest continuously operating uh, gray water recycling system in, in the state of California, perhaps in the United States. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, and what we do here is we take the, all the hygiene water out of about a 250 person office building. We purify it to potable levels, although we don't, do not allow people to drink it or use it as potable water. We actually just use it to flush the toilets. And um, the reason we go to potable standard for flushing the toilets is because of the potential liability of, you know, a guide dog drinking out of the toilet or per perhaps somebody brings their kid to school to, to work one day and the kid's, you know, sticking his hand in the toilet. So we do take it all the way to potable, but we do not allow uh, human consumption of it. And that system is about a thousand gallons a day, although it's very rare that we produce a thousand gallons of, uh, of hygiene water, of uh, gray water in this building, but it has that capability of a, a thousand gallons a day. Uh, we've also, oh, sorry, this is a process flow diagram of how that works. So if you look at the, the item there, the FO membrane contactor, the kind of almost pink looking tubes, those are basically the beakers, the cups that we've been talking about. On one side is the feed, the feed tank. And on the other side, again, we're using salt water here. So we have salt water on the other side. And in this case, we actually regenerate the salt water using a, a traditional reverse osmosis desalination system. That's something that's used for desalinating seawater. And that produces then a pure water uh, product that's sent to a product storage tank. It reconstitutes the salt solution, reconcentrates up again the salt solution, which is then passed back to the FO contactor to produce a, a continuous process. Uh, another application of this was uh, a forward operating basis. We, uh, the system that was running at the Green Building NASA AIDS came to the attention of the Army, and they provided us with some funding to build a deployable uh, uh, gray water recycling system, primarily for use in forward operating bases. Forward operating bases are the smallest fixed facility that the Army operates in, in conflict zones, meaning, you know, they have buildings and fences and walls. And, uh, you know, most soldiers uh, will, will go from a forward operating base, go out on a mission, and then return back. And one of the key parameters is uh, clothes washing in a forward operating base. If you ever saw pictures of soldiers in Afghanistan or or Iraq, and it's, you know, it's 120 degrees out there, and they're, you know, wearing full combat uh, fatigues. Uh, the key, those are very high-tech performance cl uh, clothing, and the key to them is to keep them clean. They don't work as well if they're dirty. And so Ford operating bases have huge volume of, uh, of gray water that they produce, wash water they produce, and they typically truck it away. So they truck away the wastewater, and they truck in the water, and that's a, a logistical weakness. Uh, the uh, the insurgents uh, tend to attack those truck uh, truck caravans, and uh, during the Iraq War, the highest civilian loss of life associated with U.S. operations were these truck drivers that were local local people. And so, they, what they're interested in doing is eliminating that logistic train. They want to recycle all the water on site, recycle the hygiene water back, and reuse it for clothes washing. So, we built this unit. This is a a, a, a tricon container. It's basically an eight by eight cube. Uh, designed to be air droppable to the site, um, and this one can can produce about 4,800 gallons a day of water. Uh, it's also fully automated, so it can be operated uh, remotely as well. And I think that's it. So uh, that's all I have. If uh, you guys want to take it over and, and move on to the next section, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Michael. That was great. Uh, thank you for explaining all that. That was very. Um... Very informative. Uh, yeah, and um, I will quickly go through um, the technology transfer program and uh, how everyone can apply for these technologies. And after that, we'll get to the Q&A. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Singh. I am the portfolio manager at NASA Ames Research Center. And we also have Kim Hines online who will be available. Uh, she's our uh, T2 chief. Um, and she will be able to answer any questions at the end about licensing. 
So I just wanted to give an overview about the program and where it's located. So we have 10 different NASA centers. Uh, we're here in Silicon Valley NASA Research Center. And each of these NASA centers has a technology transfer program and each center kind of specializes in their own uh, research and development. So the AIMS core competencies are intelligent and adaptive systems, entry systems, advanced computing and IT systems, aerosciences, air traffic management, astrobiology and life science, cost-effective space missions, and space and earth science. And so uh, th that's our uh, core competencies and uh, maybe a place like a Johnson Space Flight Center would have uh, some aspects of that, but they would be more heavily focused on uh, human space flight. So just a quick overview, what we're gonna be talking about is what is technology transfer, uh, license agreements, the patent portfolio, and how to access those technologies, examples of the technology, a free NASA software, and then we'll get to Q and A at the end. So uh, the NASA technology transfer program has uh, been around uh, for over 50 years. And what it does is it ensures that innovations developed for space exploration and discovery are broadly available to the public, maximizing the benefit to the nation. So in that time frame, um, and since we've been surveying companies uh, since our spin-off publication uh, since 2000, we've had over 18,000 jobs uh, created from the program, $5.2 billion in revenue generated, 18.6 billion in productivity and efficiency. So that's cost avoided and by in total by companies who provided data. 30 million lives improved with the majority of them coming from uh, unique nutritional supplements uh, using baby formula and new materials uh, such as surgical implants and environmental impacts so like anti-icing technology that you see on airplanes. So whenever you're uh, out in you know a very cold environment and you'll see sometimes the planes getting sprayed down with with, uh, with something that's an uh, anti-icing technology that was created at NASA. And to illustrate um, these benefits, uh, NASA created a web feature called NASA Home and City, which people can uh, go around and see how NASA has affected the daily life in home uh, and in their everyday life when they, when they step outside. So uh, these are the three types of licensing agreements, uh, a startup license, an evaluation license, a commercial, commercial license, and you can, apply for those at technology.nasa.gov. So startup license, uh, NASA waives the initial licensing fee and there are no minimum fees for the first three years. Uh, this announcement applies to only non-exclusive licenses, which means other companies may apply for uh, similar rights to the technology. Uh, however, um, NASA will consider further exclusivity if uh, the startup wishes to negotiate later on. Companies entering into these licenses are bound by all requirements in federal licensing statutes and NASA policies, just like all the other ones, uh, including development of commercialization plan and reporting on efforts to achieve practical application. While NASA does license to foreign entities, this startup agreement is only available to companies in the United States. The second one is an evaluation license. So we'd like to call this like a test drive license. Um, all evaluation licenses are non-exclusive agreements. Most evaluation licenses last up to a year and evaluation licenses uh, are not permitted to commercialize or sell the technology. A traditional commercialization license agreement must be in place for any sales take place. And that leads us to our third one, which is a commercial license, which is our kind of the, the standard license you'll also see in other places. It's available to domestic and inter international organizations, partial exclusivity non or non-exclusive uh, availability for the license. Um, and that depends on uh, the technology and the terms are all negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis. And to learn more about those, uh, there, I'll, I'll show you a link at the end of, you can see how everything is, is structured within the licenses. So um, this is our uh, patent portfolio. We have over, we have 15 different um, uh, categories. Uh, and so again, uh, when I showed you in the beginning, we had those 10 different centers. Um, when you click on one of these technologies or one of these uh, categories, uh, you'll see a, a, a large list of technologies. Um, and then within those, you'll see all of the technologies that are related to propulsion, power generation, storage, environment, and things like that. So NASA Ames has over 110 patents available for licensing, and the entire program has over 1,200 patents available for licensing. 
So to go through how to apply for a license, because sometimes it can be a little tricky or you kind of don't know what, where to go, what to do, I'll, I'll do a step-by-step -step process. So this is the landing page. This is the technology.nasa.gov landing page. And you can either search for NASA technologies in the search bar via a keywords, or you can go to the patent portfolio uh, right here, which is highlighted. So uh, you see this page kind of like how I showed you in the in, in two slides prior, but this is what happens when you click on that on that button. And uh, as an example, we'll go through the environment category since uh, Michael just talked about his technologies. So when you click on the environment category, something like this will show up. You can uh, click through you know the search bar, uh, type in keywords, or you can click on a technology. Um, and in this case, we'll use the uh, algae photobacter for using floating enclosures with semi-permeable membranes. So when you click on that, you get to a page like this. And uh, with this page, it, it gives you an overview of the technology. So uh, a very broad overview in the beginning, the benefits, the application that could be used for, and then just an overview of the technology. And again, these uh, benefits and applications, um, these are things that it can be used for, but they're not limited to that. A user, you, you know, uh, entrepreneurs have a great imagination to uh, figure out how to use um, these technologies for very, very uh, creative things. Uh, after you, you find out more information, you can uh, click on the apply now to license technology, and then you'll go through those steps. If you have any questions, you can go through the contact us, um, and that will, uh, you can send an email to our uh, agency licensing team to ask more questions about the technology. And if you want a downloadable fact sheet, so you know, you're on the go, you don't have internet connection, things like that, um, you can download a fact sheet, which is the same information displayed on, the, um, on this website. And also if you see under the details area, uh, underneath the red box, uh, you can see um, that there's a patent assigned to it. So if you want to look more into the patent, uh, you can click on that and it'll take you to the US Patent Office website where you can uh, view the patent. There's again, a quick overview on the licensing types. Uh, it's a startup license, a valuation license, a commercial license. Um, these are all uh, uh, variable. So whatever you want, um, whatever fits your need, feel free to, to, to go down that route. Uh, within the confines of the uh, licensing agreement types. And uh, lastly, we have our free software, uh, which is really awesome. So our free software allows uh, companies um, to use NASA software that was created for our moon space missions, whatever it might be, Earth-based missions. And so there's uh, three main categories. And then within the general purpose, there's three other categories. So the government purpose one is if you have government contract um, and you need access to the uh, software. The general purpose one is uh, what's going to fit the bill for most people. So it's US only. Uh, you have to be a US company for that. US and foreign. Um, so that's open to any US and foreign company uh, that can apply for it. And then public is uh, open for the general public. And then we also have our open source, which is open for everybody. And those te those technologies can be found at software.nasa.gov and our uh, code.nasa.gov. Uh, these are the three technologies that were talked about today. Uh, please feel free to either write this down or take a screenshot uh, of the technologies. It, it was also on the website uh, where um, you can register for the event. And uh, these are some helpful uh, links about uh, the program, how to license NASA technology. So that will give you uh, more in-depth details on how the licensing process works, the NASA patents, free software, the success stories. Uh, Michael talked about a few of them, but these are also success stories on all of our other uh, technologies that have been licensed um, and are out in the general public. NASA Home and City is the is that virtual uh, success story uh, web face that I was talked about, and then any additional resources can be found um, at uh, that link below. So thank you everyone. I appreciate you um, attending and uh, let's uh, get to your questions. I appreciate it.